Israel was once a united monarchy uh, under the Davidic king. The 12 tribes of Israel, they all followed, they all took their orders from the God-ordained Davidic king in Jerusalem. But when Solomon died, that all changed. The nation of Israel split into two different and two separate kingdoms, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Now, how did that happen? For all of the great that King Solomon did, he, he built the, the temple, he made Israel prosperous, one giant mark against him was that he would tax the people heavily. He had a poll tax, he had an income tax, he had other different kinds of taxes, and he imposed this on the Israelites, and because of that, the Israelites were very tired of it. So after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam was about to take the throne, and a man named Jeroboam comes up and he asks a request from, from Rehoboam. And this is what he asks in 1 Kings 12. Your father, talking about Solomon, made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke upon us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam sent him away and said that he'll get back to him on that in a few days. He said, give me three days to think about this. And so Rehoboam then goes to the very counselors that, that Solomon had had, uh, the ones that had counseled Solomon when he was king, and he asked them, what should I do? And Solomon's counselors, they agreed with Jeroboam. They said, you should make it easier on the people. You should lighten the load. Rehoboam doesn't stop there. He then goes to counselors who are people of his own age, people that he grew up with, and he asks them what they think he should do with the nation. And their response is, you should be even harder than Solomon was. So Rehoboam has a, a decision to make in 1 Kings 12. Is he going to lighten the load as some ask him to do, or is he going to make things harder for Israel? His decision is recorded in verses 13 and 14 of 1 Kings 12. And listen to this. And the king answered the people harshly, and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him, he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So he decided that he's going to make things even more difficult. And what do you think is the, the, res, uh, the result of that decision? Because he made things more difficult, 10 of the 12 tribes uh, rebelled and revolted uh, against Rehoboam, and only two tribes remained loyal to the house of David. Those two tribes are Judah and Benjamin. The southern king, Judah and Benjamin, had the Davidic line, and they were simply called Judah. The northern kingdom made Jeroboam their king, and the northern kingdom was known as Israel. You all may notice that in your Bibles if you read after this event, often the, the southern kingdom, it'll just say Judah, it's talking about uh, the southern kingdom, and it may say Israel, and it's refer referring not to the entire nation or all 12 tribes, it's referring to the northern kingdom. So the 12 tribes split into two different kingdoms. But there were also promises in Scripture that talked about these two kingdoms once again becoming one, becoming united again under a Davidic king. Steve Hoffman read one of those texts this morning, but let me just read two of the verses again. It says, One king shall be king over them all, and they shall no longer be two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. My servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. So Ezekiel's point is that one day these two kingdoms are going to be one under a coming Davidic king. 
Now remember that for later on. If you guys remember last week, uh, we discussed the narrative of the, the stoning of Stephen. Stephen had told the Jews that their focus on Moses and the temple kept them from seeing that they were simply temporary shadows that ultimately pointed to Jesus. And he also argued, and we didn't get to cover this because of time, that even though Solomon built the temple of God, he did build the house of God. Solomon didn't ultimately fulfill God's promise to David that you're going to have a son that's going to build me a temple. Solomon did build a physical temple, but Stephen argues that Solomon wasn't ultimately that son. Jesus was that son, and he and the temple he builds comes by him baptizing his people with the Holy Spirit, deity resting inside of a believer, and they then now become the new temple of God. If you can understand that, then you can understand why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, I believe, that don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? But people, uh, Stephen was, he was also making the point that people no longer have to come to Jerusalem to encounter God. Jesus said at the beginning of Acts in Acts 1 that he wants the gospel, he wants them to be his witnesses, the apostles to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and then to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And Jesus according to Stephen, can meet people right where they are. And they killed Stephen. They stoned him. And what we see in our text is that the stoning of Stephen is going to lead to the gospel going to the second stage of Jesus' plan that he laid out in chapter 1 which is for the people to move on from Jerusalem and to go into Samaria. Now, how does the killing of Stephen do that? How does the killing of Stephen lead to the gospel going to Samaria? Well, in verses 1 to 8, uh, the killing of Stephen, it led to an increased persecution of the church. Uh, the second part of verse 1, it begin, uh, beginning with the word and, it said, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. So stoning Stephen led to the Jews in Jerusalem to become even more aggressive towards the Christian movement. And they began to persecute the church even more, more violently. And look who is leading the charge uh, against Jerusalem. It says Saul was. Verse 1, it says Saul approved of his execution. Now look down at verse 3. But Saul was ravishing the church, ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Ravaging uh, is used here to highlight the devastatingly violent and destru how destructive and violent this, this persecution was. Saul was perhaps the, the greatest enemy of the Christian movement, certainly one of the ones that's recorded in scripture. Saul, if you want to understand Saul, he believed, he came from a tradition that believed that all the promises of God in scripture, the kingdom coming back to Israel, the coming king from the Davidic line, all of that would come to pass very soon if only Israel would stay pure by following the Torah and protecting the temple. But that also meant getting rid of any movements that threatened to corrupt Israel. Listen to how one scholar puts uh, Saul's mindset. From the point of view of Saul of Tarsus, the first followers of Jesus of Nazareth were a prime example of the deviant behavior that had to be eradicated if Israel's God was to be honored. Saul of Tarsus was therefore zealous in persecuting these people. Everything possible had to be done to stamp out a movement that would impede the true purposes of the one God of Israel, whose divine plan Saul and his friends believed that were at long last on the verge of glorious fulfillment. Luke, he mentions Paul here, but, but much like weaving where you see a thread go, come out on the surface, then go under, this narrative with Saul here is, is coming out on the surface, but it's about to go back under again until chapter 9 where it pokes back out. So what was the, the result of Saul persecuting the church? What end did that lead to? 
Well, it led to the gospel going to Samaria. Look at the second to last clause in verse one, uh, starting with, uh, with and again. And they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And, and so many of these Christians that scattered, some of them went to Judea, the, the, the southern kingdom, and many of the Christians went to Samaria. And when the Christians arrived in Samaria, they shared the gospel. Look at verse four. Now those who were scattered, that is, those left in Jerusalem and went to Judea and Samaria, went about preaching the word. So Luke in in verse 4 is giving a general narrative teaching us how the persecution of the church led to sharing of the gospel in other regions. But now Luke in verses 5 to 8 is going to focus in a little more and get a little bit more specific. He mentions a man named Philip going to Samaria and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Who was Philip? If you guys remember a couple chapters back, Philip was one of the Hellenistic Jewish Christians that, were, that was selected to take care of the, the Hellenistic widows that were being left out in the daily food distribution. And Philip, he was also part of the Christian group that scattered from Jerusalem and went to Samaria. And when he arrived, the text says that he, in verse 8, says he performed signs and healings, and because of that, the city was full of joy. In verse 6, it says that they listened to Philip, and if you skip down to verse 12, the text actually says they believed the gospel and were even baptized. Why is that so significant that the the Samaritans came to believe the gospel? Why is it important that this happened in Samaria? We need to ask ourselves a question, what was Samaria or the city of Samaria and who were the Samaritans? If you guys remember our discussion at the beginning of the sermon about how the 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel revolted against the king and the monarchy of Israel split into two different kingdoms, the capital city of the southern kingdom, Judah, was Jerusalem. Guess what the northern capital was? Samaria. 10 of the 12 tribes revolted against the Davidic king and they established their own kingdom and their own king with the capital city being Samaria. And the Samaritans, they eventually became known known as outcasts and half-breeds. Now, why would they consider them that? Well, at around 700 B.C., Uh, The Assyrians, they came and and took the Samaritans into captivity, and uh, they repopulated Samaria with Assyrians and other people groups. And for the full-blooded Jews that still remained in Samaria, they ended up marrying the foreigners that were now living in Samaria. So the Samaritan Jews would marry Assyrians, and they would marry others, and this is how they got the reputation for being half-breeds. And there was great hostility between the southern kingdom Jews and the Samaritans in the north. Rabbis from Jerusalem used to teach that to eat the food of a Samaritan is the same as eating from a pig or, from eat, or eating pork itself. And the Jews, in Jesus' time, they were giving Jesus, they thought anyways, they were giving Jesus the ultimate insult in John 8 when they asked him the question, aren't we right in saying that you have a demon and are a Samaritan? What do you think they're saying there? They're saying there's no way that Jesus can be the Davidic king. He's a descendant of Jeroboam, the one who rebelled against the house of David. And to top it all off, the Samaritans even had their own temple that they put on top of a mountain. And they believed that God should be worshipped at that temple. The southern kingdom believed that God should be worshipped in the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritans believed that uh, God should be worshipped on their temple that's on top of their mountain in Samaria. And we can see that in one statement when Jesus talks to the woman from Samaria when he tells her that one day neither on this mountain, that temple in Samaria, 
or in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, will people have to worship God? And so to summarize and get the sort of main point that I'm trying to get at here, the southern kingdom with the capital city of Jerusalem and the northern kingdom with the capital city of Samaria, they each had their own temple, their own king, and they hated each other. But as we saw, God promised reconciliation and to reunite them in Ezekiel 37, that there is going to be a king from the Davidic line that's so great that he's going to reunite Jerusalem and Samaria and the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we have to understand in Acts 1 that when Jesus, the Davidic king, a king from the Davidic line, when he tells the apostles to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in Samaria, he's not just talking about two random locations. He's essentially sending them out to initially fulfill Ezekiel's prophecy. Jesus is reuniting the two tribes of the south with the ten tribes from the north to once again become a kingdom under him. And we've already seen what happens when thousands of Jews in Jerusalem believe in Jesus. They become a family. And now in, te- in our text, Jerus- Jews from Jerusalem are coming to Samaria, and Samaritans are now believing in Jesus. And that's uh, significant because Jesus is the Davidic king that reunited Jews and Samaritans, brought together the 12 tribes of Israel. I love the the movie The Lord of the Rings. I've uh, borrowed it from somebody now for like going on eight or nine months. Uh, Probably need to get my own copy. But Tolkien, he's the author of Lord of the Rings. He would use Christian themes in books. Uh, He was a Christian. But he didn't like the use of allegory or having one character in a story represent someone from Scripture. He says he didn't really like that and he accused Lewis of doing stuff like that. But he came really close with the character of Aragorn. There were two kingdoms in Lord of the Rings. There was Arnor and and Gondor. And for 3,000 years, these kingdoms were divided. But then along comes this, this humble ranger in Lord of the Rings named Aragorn, who was the heir to the throne. And when he was eventually crowned and set on the throne, the two kingdoms came together and united under him. Well, now the two kingdoms of Israel are uniting under this humble carpenter, heir to the throne from Nazareth. And this has some application for us um, with everything going on in the world, racism particularly being a hot topic in America. We have seen so far that when people believe in the gospel, they have a shared love and interest in Jesus. They become a family. And just how the text shows that the gospel breaks down the hostility between Jews from Jerusalem and Samaritans and makes them a family, the gospel today still has the power to reconcile people of all different skin colors and ethnicities and nationalities. And it does this because the gospel gives us an identity that supersedes all others. When you become a Christian, you are primarily and before all other things a Christian. Everything else about you, your racial identity, your national identity, they become a far distant second to who you are now in Jesus. And because the Bible doesn't tolerate, even for a moment, judging people based on their skin color, a racist Christian is an oxymoron. We can speak up, be active, and do all kinds of other things, and many of those things do have an impact. But to truly transform someone into a person who wholeheartedly accepts another, they need a new Christian identity that comes only through the preaching of the gospel. Let's move on to the next section, verses 9 to 25. After Philip, I'm not going to read the text. Um, After Philip 
uh, was, had won over the Samaritans to Jesus through preaching the gospel and, and doing signs and healing, Luke now introduces us to a man named Simon. Who was Simon? Well, Simon was a Samaritan. In verses 9 and 11, they say that he was into practicing magic. Now, practicing magic in the ancient world, uh, those who did it, they believed that you could harness the power of, of gods and demons through incantations and manipulating objects. Today, we would refer to this as witchcraft or sorcery or, or the occult, or in some levels, even animism, trying to control forces by doing certain things. And because of his ability to harness and use demonic power, Simon made claims for himself. Because he was able to do this, he made claims to himself. The end of verse 9 says that he claimed that he was somebody great. And given the connection of the word great in verses 9 and 10, it most likely means that Simon was making the claim that he was the power of God that is called great for himself. He was saying that about himself. Now, the meaning of that claim, the power of God that is called great, that is ambiguous at best. Schnabel claims it could mean one of two things. He says it could be claiming that he is the highest of all supernatural powers. Out of all the supernatural powers out there, Simon is the highest of them all. Or he could be claiming to be divine. To a Christian, going around doing these things and making these kinds of claims, he would have been a false Christ, a false Messiah. But to the Samaritans, he was very popular. Look at verse 10. It says that all the people from the least to the greatest paid attention to him. So whether they were rich or poor, educated or not, everybody was paying attention to what Simon was doing. And this gives you a sense of where Samaria was at during this time. The fact that they would all pay attention to a man doing things like this. And verse 11 tells us he had done this for a very long time. And he had such respect uh, that the last participial clause in verse 10, it shows that the, God, that the people in Samaria agreed with Simon's claims about himself. Because they're saying it about him. When we go through Acts, we're going to see Jesus face off against a lot of different kinds of people. We're going to see Jesus versus the gods of the Gentiles. And eventually, at the very end of Acts, we're going to see Paul in Rome testifying that Jesus is Lord right under Caesar's nose. But in our text, we're seeing Jesus in Samaria versus Simon. And we've already noted that verse 11 says that the Samaritans believed Philip's message about Jesus. It says, but when they believed Philip. So the Samaritans, they were into watching the powers of the demonic forces, and they enjoyed watching Simon, and they were amazed by him. But now the Samaritans were seeing the true power of God working through Philip, and rather than believe Simon's claims to divinity, they were now believing that Jesus was the true Messiah. And so now, what is Simon going to do? He's no longer the talk of the town. In Simon's mind, he's been outdone. He's been upstaged by Philip. I love basketball. And uh, several years ago, one of my favorite uh, basketball players was Kevin Durant. And uh, Durant was in the top two or three players in the entire league. He still is. And he played for my team, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Well, in 2016, the Oklahoma City Thunder, led by Durant, made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals to play against the Golden State Warriors. And that was a great, hard-fought series. And they were even up 3-1 to one in the series at one point. But eventually, the Golden State Warriors, they, they rallied back and they, and they won the, the series. Came back and won three games in a row. Guess what Kevin Durant did in the offseason? 
He left the Oklahoma City Thunder, and he signed with the very team that beat them in the Western Conference Finals, the Golden State Warriors. Durant believed in the old adage, if you can't beat them, join them. Simon believed that too. If you look at verse 13, it teaches that Simon believed and was baptized and even followed around Philip. Now, there was a big problem with the conversion of Simon and the Samaritans. Because even though Luke records that they believed, it also says that they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. So they send for the apostles, and John and Peter, they come up from Jerusalem. And if you look all the way up back at the last clause in verse 1, Luke says that the apostles, they didn't scatter, they stayed in Jerusalem. And so they came, they laid their hands on the Samaritans, they prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit, and it worked. Verse 17 says the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. Now coming back to Simon for a second, there is debate about Simon's conversion. It seems that most commentators and, and those in the early church thought that Simon was a false convert. And those that argue that there is genuine faith in Simon, they point to the fact that Luke mentions that Simon believed. And when the New Testament writers use the word believe, it's usually not this shallow, empty, mere intellectual assent that's often thrown around today. It had substance to it. It meant something. But I think I side with the commentators that think his faith wasn't genuine. Look at what Luke tells us about Simon after believing in the last sentence of verse 9. And seeing the signs and great wonders, he, that is Simon, was amazed. Jesus dealt with something similar before in John 2. Listen to what John 2 says. Now when he was in Jerusalem... At the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So were these people in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, they saw the miraculous healings and the other things Jesus was doing, and, and the people, John says in the text, believed in Jesus because of that. But Jesus... He knew that their profession of faith was both artificial and superficial at the same time, and so he didn't spend any time on them. Jesus knew that they were sign seekers. Their faith rested on spectacular events rather than on the claims that Jesus made about himself. And Simon himself was amazed at the power of God he saw working through Philip. Philip he realized that it was a far greater, far superior power than any power he'd ever received through any false god or demonic force. And he thought that if he could join the Christian movement, befriend Philip, follow him around, that he would somehow be able to harness this power for himself. And now he has just witnessed Peter and John come to Jerusalem, pray, lay hands on uh, the Samaritan believers, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And as he's watching this, he's inwardly desiring to have that kind of power for himself so that he can do even greater acts than he did before and have everyone paying attention to him again. And so we shouldn't be surprised to read about what he does in verses 18 and 19. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was giving through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Notice what Simon doesn't ask for. He doesn't ask to receive the Holy Spirit. He asks for the power to give away the Holy Spirit. And he's so deceived that he believes something so serious, so solemn, so sacred, something that ought to be revered could be bought with money. If you've ever heard the word simony, 
which means attempting to buy an ecclesiastical office or something sacred with money, it originates from our text and is talking about the narrative of Simon. And so Peter, disgusted and seeing the perverse nature of the offer, responds by saying, essentially, the sacred's not for sale. You thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money, verse 20? May your silver perish with you. In other words, just as your money will one day pass away and be gone, hopefully you do the same. In the Christian life, there is a time and place for a hard rebuke, which is what Peter does here. But Peter didn't leave him there. He also responded with grace. If you look at verse 22, he calls Simon to repent, that if possible, the intent of his heart could be forgiven him. Ultimately, Peter wanted Simon to be forgiven. And Simon, for one reason or another, he wouldn't even pray for himself, but he asked Peter to do it to pray on his behalf. And kind of frustratingly, we don't, we don't know what happened to Simon, but the story does have a couple things that we can learn. God can give us the best things in life for free because Jesus purchased it at an infinite cost. God can give to us the most infinite things for free, infinite person, or the sacred persons, sacred things for free because Jesus purchased it at an infinite cost. In the 16th century, uh, Pope Leo from the Catholic Church, he needed funds um, because he had an extravagant lifestyle and he wanted to build uh, and construct St. Peter's Basilica. Leo decided to get money by having people give money to the church. And in exchange, the Catholic Church would offer their relatives forgiveness for their sins and have a shorter duration in purgatory. The Catholic Church called these indulgences. You guys give us money, we'll give you forgiveness of sins. Shorter time in purgatory. And it was this medieval form of simony thinking that the forgiveness of sins can be bought with money, something only the blood of Jesus can do, is one of the things that sparked the Reformation. We may not be so blatant as the 16th century Catholic Church was, but we also participate in simony by thinking even a little that we earn God's favor when we tithe or are on our best behavior. Now, it's true that, as J.C. Ryle says in his book on holiness, that if you begin to participate in sinful habits and patterns, that you will quench the Spirit. Because the Spirit is holy, there will be a strangeness between you and the Spirit as you are participating in sinful habits. And the way to walk in a manner and worthy of the Lord, as, as Paul says in Ephesians, is through discipline and godly habits. But at the root of all of that... The foundation is always the cross. All of the salvific gifts of God, all the uh, spiritual blessings, forgiveness of sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, a relationship with God, all of that was purchased by Jesus' blood, which is infinitely more valuable, infinitely more costly than anything we could find in Bill Gates or Warren Buffett's bank account. Listen to what Peter, in chapter 1 of his first epistle, says. This is 1 Peter. It was not with perishable... And he's probably thinking back in his conversation with Simon, Simon, now that I'm thinking about this when he writes this. It was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life you inherited from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. He's assuming there that the blood of Christ is infinitely more worthy, more valuable than silver and gold. How precious, how wonderful does that blood have to be? 
Only the blood of Jesus Christ can purchase us the gifts of God. If you're listening in this morning and you've heard about what happened to Simon, there's application for you as well. If you come to Jesus Christ for anything other than the forgiveness of sin and to bow the knee to Jesus, you won't be forgiven. If you've come to Jesus so that you can have a better life or because you like that people will think that you're moral or something like that, you are coming for the wrong reasons. Jesus came to deal with sin and he did that on the cross. The payment that we owed for our sins was paid for by Jesus on the cross. That was what he came for. And that's what you have to come to him for. Go to him. Pray for forgiveness of sin. He will forgive you and God can be just because Jesus paid for it on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we've all participated in Simon's sin in one way or another. And I just pray, Father, that you help us to know how infinitely valuable and great and holy your gifts are. And thank you that we can receive the Holy Spirit. We can receive the forgiveness of sins. We can receive these things at no cost at all to us. And we are so thankful for that to you, Father. I pray that you would bring that to our minds some way special this week, that we would know and be so thankful to Jesus for purchasing gifts that will last into eternity and will not fade away. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.